Amen. What a beautiful day God's given us. A little windy out there. Um, we got us a warm fire. It's comfortable in here. And God is good. Amen. So this morning I want to talk about the atonement. I was going to do that this afternoon. Uh, but being this is a doctrinal time, I want to go ahead and talk about it this morning. And I'm going to give you uh, a little bit more about the importance of the blood. I'm going to give you three things. Um, but we'll get to that in time. Let's jump over to 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 18. He says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by Him do believe in God, that raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely the central theme throughout the entire Bible, but especially the New Testament. Uh, just very quickly here, I've got lots of verses. If you want a copy of the outline, that's no problem. I can give this one to you or make you another one. But let me just very quickly say eight things that happened because of the blood. The Bible says in Romans 5, 9 that we are justified through the blood. Not as death, but through the blood. Romans 3, 25 says that the blood is our propitiation. If you remember the doctrinal words, that, that simply means an assuaging of anger or a satisfying from wrath. We are redeemed through the blood, as we read there in uh, verse 18. Ephesians 1 also tells us, Colossians 1, Hebrews 9, Revelation 5. We're cleansed or washed in the blood according to Hebrews 9. We are reconciled by the blood, Colossians 1 and Ephesians 2. We are sanctified through the blood. That means set apart. Seventh, we have victory through the blood. And number eight, we come before the Father because of the blood. If that blood was, if the blood of Jesus Christ was not on the mercy seat of heaven. None of us could pray. None of us could come to God. The blood is the central theme. It's the most important element of the atonement. Amen. And of course, we know the atonement is, we could also call it the at one -ment. It totally was used, or the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was totally used to assuage God's wrath towards sin. He carried all that wrath out on His own Son. And then to be able to invite us in to fellowship with Himself. When that temple veil was rent from top to bottom, come on in. Amen? So anyway, we see this at the depiction of the Lord's table, which we're going to be taking next week in the afternoon. I mean, why do we have a cup? Why do we have juice and not water. Amen? Because it's both the death of Jesus Christ and the blood. You can't, you have to have both. Amen? But that blood on the mercy seat drained out of the Lord's body is proof that He died for us. No one can drain their blood out and live through that. Amen? Of course, He laid down His own life because He's God. But anyway, I want to continue the theme, the importance of the blood this morning. And I want to define the, the, um, some things about the blood a little bit deeper. Uh, so I'm going to define the blood. All right. So there, there's a lot of questions that could be asked. If it took blood, couldn't I have just died for my own sin? Can I have shed my own blood? We see in the Old Testament where they uh, killed goats and 
and uh, bulls and things like that. Could not have just offered something like that and it had been fine. But no, it's, it's, it's more important than that, okay? And, um, well, I'm just going to give you three points this morning. But anyway, Hebrews 10.4 says this, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So in other words, not just any blood can atone for the sins of the entire world. It took something special. All the blood that was shed in all the Levitical uh, animal sacrifices, which we know were a shadow, the reality was in Christ, it was unable to take away sins. It was temporary. It was a picture of what Christ would do that was settled before the foundation of the world. A man cannot personally atone for his own sin by shedding his own blood, as Mormonism would have you to believe, for the simple reason of, of this. Our blood is sinful blood. You bleed out, it rots. It rots. Christ's blood is precious, still fresh on the mercy seat. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Only the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient and efficient to do the things that needs to be done for us to be right with God. It's the only thing that's enough and will do the job. Amen? So three things about the blood this morning. Number one, it must be pure blood if it's going to be the blood of the atonement. It has to be pure blood. Only the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, was sinless. No other man was sinless, so no other man could offer that sacrifice. Uh, according to Acts 17, 26, it says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Can I tell you, all the blood in the world came from Adam. That's Adam's blood that flows through your veins. Amen? Adam's blood is tainted blood. In Romans 5.12 it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, Christ's flesh is human. 100%. Born of a virgin, His flesh is human, but not His blood. I'll show you why here in a minute. In Hebrews 2.14, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. No one else could die and destroy the power of death. There must be something different about the Lord Jesus that made that possible. See, I want to tell you that Jesus Christ only took part of the composition of mankind. He was born of a virgin. The bloodline comes through your father. Your flesh basically comes from your mother. It's real easy to trace. Um, if, if, if a man's going to be bald, look at his mother's father. That's, that's how you know usually, because flesh traces through the mother. The father is the bloodline. Amen? That's why we carry the name of the man when we get married and all those things because he is the bloodline. Uh, well, Christ's blood, he didn't have a human father. The Holy Spirit moved on the Virgin Mary and, boy, I hate putting those words together. I almost sound Catholic, but, but she was the Virgin Mary and uh, moved on her and she con uh, uh, conceived a child by the power of the Holy Ghost. You say, how was that possible? Well, He created everything just by His words. I'm pretty sure He can do that too. But He did. Anyway, Christ's blood is God's blood. It's not, it's not just blood. You say, God has blood? He does in the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 20, 28 says this, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Now watch. To feed the church of God, which He hath purchased 
with His own blood. You see it? It's the blood of God, isn't it? That, that's why we've got to come to Christ. This is the only one that's pure blood. So we've already read there, for as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So the blood that atones has to be pure. Only the Lord Jesus Christ meets that standard. The second thing is it has to be presented. You say, well, what's so particular, important about that? Well, you don't just come half-stepping to present something to God. I mean, when God told uh, the men in Genesis to uh, sacrifice, to offer sacrifice, Abel offered sacrifice and God accepted his. Abel presented a bloody lamb is what he presented. That was accepted by God. Cain had a beautiful sacrifice. Probably worked days to do that thing. Had to till and, and grow that stuff. And he probably made a beautiful vegetable platter with all the garnish and everything and brought it to the Lord and it was rejected by the Lord. You don't just come with what you think you should bring to God. Amen. Boy, that's, that's a principle that many Baptists should get a hold of. Amen. We don't just present, you know, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, you can't be doing that if you're smoking and, and, and you know, living, living an ungodly life. Amen. You're not presenting anything. Anyways, has to be presented blood. Now, we're going to go back to the book of Leviticus, if you don't mind. Uh, third book of the Bible, and we're going to be in chapter 16. I'm just going to hit some highlights here. Leviticus 16. And just to give you a little bit of a background on what was called the Day of Atonement that happened annually. Okay, the high priest, and he was the only one that could do this. No other priest could do this. The high priest would present the blood inside the holiest place by, by sprinkling it on the mercy seat. Only he could go in. See, that's why here we believe in the priesthood of the believer. We all offer spiritual sacrifices to God. I'm not your spiritual leader, uh, truly. I mean, in a way, I guess I am, but... But the Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest that's already obtained an eternal salvation for us because His blood is on the mercy seat in the holiest place. That temple on earth and that tabernacle was just a picture of what was in heaven. And Jesus actually put His blood on that mercy seat. We don't ever have to do that. And thank God because we couldn't. Amen. Our allegiance and our worship goes to Christ. Amen. That kind of separates us from the cults there. Anyway, let's look at Leviticus 16. Look at verses 2 and 3. I'm just going to kind of jump in here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother. Now who was Aaron? What was his role? High priest. That he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So even the high priest couldn't just walk in there anytime he wanted to. Okay? So verse 3 says, Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So Aaron could not go into the holy place even if he was instructed by God himself to go into the holy place. He could not do it without an appropriate presented Sacrifice. Amen. Turn with me now over to uh, verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil 
and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So as you can see, there, there's a principle here that God's given us and he used the high priest that he would present blood, typical blood. Now I'm not going to get into all the sacrifices we can do that again sometime. When we studied the tabernacle, probably about seven, eight years ago, we got into those sacrifices. What's the difference between a sin offering, a trespass offering, and all those kind of things? And we did that, but we can't today. But know this, He did it to clean up His people and the tabernacle. It's still today. The context is this is all about God's people. Amen? I know Jesus... Uh, death was efficacious for the entire world. There's no doubt about that. But he died for the church, the Bible says in Ephesians 5. And, and that's, it's all about his people. He knew who would be saved. He knew who would be baptized into the body. He knew who he would give gifts to. He knew who he would bless through that body. And it's all based on the blood. We are what we are today by the grace of God. We say that all the time. But it's the grace of God, His character, which provided the blood of His own Son that we can have the benefits of being a child of God. So anyway, we find that what we just read, if we were to go over, and we're not going to go over there now, but if we went over to Hebrews 7 and also Hebrews 9, we would find out that this was a shadow of what Christ would do. This was just a, a picture, amen? Uh, as a matter of fact, if you read in Exodus 25, you'll find that the tabernacle was patterned after the temple in heaven. And that's confirmed by Hebrews 8, uh, 5 and Hebrews 9, 23. It says that this temple that they had, or tabernacle at the time, was a picture of of the true temple of God in heaven. Now, I reckon when that temple was created. Anybody ever thought of that? I guess after Adam fell, God scurried around. We got to do something. We got to have a temple. Didn't work that way, did it? That temple had that altar as a part of the creation because God had already determined that He would give Himself on the altar of sacrifice for the sins of man. That's what that whole temple thing's all about. A man is being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Anyways, only the high priest could enter the holiest place. We read that. Hebrews 9, 7 confirms it. Christ is our great high priest. Aaron was a picture. Christ is our priest. And it's a whole new living way because... Aaron was of the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. Man, he, Christ came from the tribe of Judah. And that's a promise all the way from Genesis 49, all the way through into the New Testament, that he would come out of Judah. He offered his blood, Christ, before the mercy seat in heaven. And we're going to kind of dig this up just a little bit here. It was presented, when Christ presented that blood in heaven, it was a perfect presentation. No flaws. He walked right in boldly and put it down before the Father because He's 100% accepted. There was no fear on Christ to go, well, I hope this is good enough. I tried my best. No. He presented it in. And it's apparent Okay, there's no verse that says this exactly, but it's apparent that, that Christ ascended to heaven to present His blood immediately after His resurrection. Let me give you an example of that, okay? In John 20, in verse 17, Jesus came back and Mary Magdalene was standing there and she recognized Him as her Master, her Lord. And Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. 
But go to my brethren, saying to them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So there's two things of notice there. One, you couldn't touch him until he ascended. Okay? Number two is that he was saying right now, go tell them, I am ascending to my Father. So he, he ascended right there. When, when the, the book of Ephesians tells us that he, he led captivity, he, or ascended on high, led captivity, captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men, that was all right here. This is what he's talking about. And he had his blood with him. John 20 and verse 27, a mere 10 verses later, Jesus shows back up to the disciples. And if you remember, there was one fellow there, one uh, apostle named Thomas. What do we call Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Because he doubted. He said, unless I put my finger into the nail prints in his hands and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe he resurrected. Jesus said to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now, what happened within those ten verses? Well, Jesus said in verse 17, You can't touch me because I've got to bring this sacrifice to my Father. And He says, I ascend to my Father now. Now, all of a sudden, we see Him ten verses later, and now He's back in the room. Okay? And says, touch me. What do you think happened? Well, he ascended up on high. How did he ascend? He presented his pure blood. Nothing else could do it. As a matter of fact, the book of Hebrews says in chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, it says, But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, who could enter into the holy place? The high priest. He's a high priest. And it says, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves. Now watch this. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now there's not just one verse that tells us what went on here, but, but you put this together and it's very clear to me that the day he resurrected, he, he spoke to Mary and boy, he blessed her. What a faithful lady. She didn't, she didn't abandon it. What a faithful lady. He said, ah, she was a harlot. Well, that's what Christ does is he converts people. He changes them. Amen. They become a new person. They're not the same person and they've been washed in the blood. Amen. And he, he chooses her to tell the apostles that I'm ascending up and I'll be back. And Hebrews tells us in chapter 9 that he ascended up with his blood one time. Amen. Not twice, not three times, one time. Amen. All right. So pretty good stuff, huh? It's, it's good to understand doctrine. When you understand what's actually happening in the Bible, and I know there's a lot of verses here, and I don't expect you to memorize them. But what I expect you to understand is if you're redeemed by the blood, that you know what that means. Amen? And that way you'll know. If we all got separated, the world just blew apart, we all ended up in prison, it doesn't matter, we would still understand Christ and we would be able to discuss Him with other people. Am I right? Amen. That's why we got to learn doctrine. I know it's a little bit boring, but hey, that's why we do it first, because it's people are more awake. Well, at least some of us. All right. The next thing is this. This is just as important as the rest, and it has to be preserved blood. has to be preserved blood. The Bible teaches us, I believe very clearly, that the blood of Jesus Christ is in heaven right now. Amen? So it's obvious that God must have preserved it. Right? What that means to us is that the blood of Jesus Christ is still efficacious today. It didn't dry up. 
it didn't go down into a creek and touch some lepers and they got healed like what uh, Ben-Hur would teach us. Amen. It didn't just get scattered everywhere and they lost it. Jesus Christ presented His blood to the Father and it was set on the mercy seat. Amen. It's still efficacious today. And you say, well, how do you know that, Brother Sam? Because 1 John 1, 7 tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin. 7 and 9. That the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. So you tell me, how is it going to cleanse us if it's not preserved? No other blood can do that. Only Christ can do that. Anyway, let me give you the thought of this. There are prophecies of future events that speak of fresh blood. Stuff that hadn't even happened yet. And it'll still be about the blood. For instance, when you go to Zechariah 13.6, you'll find that Jesus has wounds. Not scars. I know we love to say scars and we love the song, One Scarred Hand. I love that song. Sang it many times. Um, but the Bible teaches that there are wounds. How else did Thomas thrust his hand into his side? Because it was a wound. It wasn't a scab. And it wasn't healed over by some celestial plastic surgery. Amen? Elestioplasty. Amen? It wasn't that at all. Um, here's another thing. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, if we're going to talk future, the Bible says that when they saw Christ, that, it, that He was as a lamb as it had been slain. It didn't say a carcass. It didn't say dead. It said, it looks like it's been slain. Now, how do you know that? I mean, how do I know that? I'm standing here and I'm looking over there and I see a dead lamb. How do I know that it's been slain? I don't until I get up and investigate. Well, this one's bloody, so it's easy to see. Amen? Amen. It looks like it's been slain. It has open wounds. Now, turn with me to Hebrews 12 and verse 24. I was going to use this earlier, but I want to use it now right here at the end of our lesson. Hebrews 12, and I want you to look at verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Did you notice here that it said that the blood speaks, not spoke? There's a difference in there. That's because I believe now, I mean, I, I could always be wrong if, if, if the Bible. Uh, doesn't just clearly state something, sometimes a person can be wrong. There's no doubt about that. Even, even the most diligent of students in the Bible. But I think it's easy to see by combining these simple thoughts that the blood of Jesus Christ is pure blood. It was presented to the Father on the only grounds that it could be accepted. And it's preserved. I believe it's still just as fresh as it ever was. Next Sunday, we're going to drink of that cup. That's an emblem, not of what He did, but also what He's doing. It shows His death till He comes. Amen? I believe that it's fresh. Indeed, there is power in the blood. Now I'm going to give you a quote that came um, from... Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and I'm using him because he's the E.F. Hutton of Baptists. You know, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Uh, people want to, when I quote a preacher, 
that, that says something good, you got to give people credit. You, you can't just quote it and say it's yours. But they automatically assume that I align myself with Spurgeon. No, I don't. I align myself with Jesus Christ in the King James Bible. Amen. Amen. Spurgeon can be wrong. Spurgeon was wrong on some things. Sam Morris can be wrong. I've been wrong on some things. But if I make a good quote that's biblical and someone wants to use it, they ought to say, Sam Morris said that. Don't worry, there's not too many quotes from Sam Morris. All right? But anyway, in Leviticus 4 and verse 7, the Bible says, And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord. See, before he could even go into the holiest place, there was an altar of incense right there in front. And it was also, uh, it, it had the uh, coals from the altar on it. And it had this special incense that was against the law to make other than for that purpose. And it had these little horns on it. And I'm not going to get into what all that means. We've done that before. But he would sprinkle it on those horns before he would go in to the holiest place. Anyway, here's what Spurgeon says about it. The altar of incense is the place where saints present their prayers and praises. And it is delightful to think of it as sprinkled with the blood of the great sacrifice. This it is which makes all our worship acceptable with Jehovah. He sees the blood of His own Son and therefore accepts our uh, homage. It is well for us to fix our eyes upon the blood of the one offering for sin. Sin mingles even with our holy things and our best repentance, faith, prayer, and thanksgiving could not be received of God were it not for the merit of the atoning sacrifice. Many sneer at the blood, but to us it is the foundation of comfort and hope. That which is on the horns of the altar is meant to be prominently before our eyes when we draw near to God. The blood gives strength to prayer, and hence it is on the altar's horns. It is, quote, before the Lord, and therefore it ought to be before us. It is on the altar before we bring the incense. It is there to sanctify our offerings and our gifts. Come, let us pray with confidence, since the victim is offered, capital V. The merit has been pleaded, the blood is within the veil and the prayers of believers must be sweet unto the Lord. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I think he knew a little bit about what he was talking. Amen. So anyway, I hope this was a blessing to you as we learned. Um, pretty good. A little over 30 minutes. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll continue services. <clears throat>